the seventh in this chapter looks at optimal control. Earlier videos then introduced the concept of state feedback and demonstrated that it moves the poles. So if you have a state space system x dot equals ax plus bu and you introduce a feedback u equals minus kx then you get a new transition matrix a minus bk which has different pole positions. It was shown that when a system is fully controllable that's the key point, if it's fully controllable, the poles can be placed arbitrarily, that is, wherever you want. However, it is also clear that in general it is not obvious where to place the poles, and hence we need a more systematic design procedure than simple pole placement in general. Now, typical guidance for selecting pole positions might be to start from something like a root loci analysis, which tells you where the poles would go as you change the gain of a compensator. And you might suggest that we want the closed loop poles to be near to the open loop poles. And the logic for that is that if you're trying to get the system to behave in a natural fashion, you're not having to force it too much. But if you're trying to move the poles to very different positions, then you're likely to be using aggressive inputs and therefore you may get a sensitive loop. Nevertheless, what do we mean by close? This is a rather ill-defined concept. And also, if you've got to place n poles explicitly, rather than just get a nominal area for the dominant poles, then you might get an over-exacting or over-specified design, which is unhelpful. In practice, we're happy for poles to be in a region. I want it to be roughly here, but I'm not worried where it is precisely. So what's the proposal? Instead of specifying pole positions precisely, we want some degrees of freedom which allow us to use a proxy okay, um, for getting the poles that we want. And the proxy we're going to use is some measure of closed loop performance. So what we want to do is say, What's the impact of these poles on closed loop performance? And how can I choose the poles that give me the best closed loop performance rather than specifying the poles first? Now, such a proxy should allow us to do more systematic design while giving enough slack for the feedback to place non-dominant poles wherever it likes. We don't really need to place the non-dominant poles, they don't matter. So having to place them means that we're giving up degrees of freedom that we don't want to give up. So a proxy we're going to use is called a performance index. So a performance index is a mathematical measure of the quality of system behavior. So if you have a large J, a large performance index, it implies you've got poor performance, and a small j implies good performance. Now, performance is often defined using attributes such as this, rise time, settling time, overshoot oscillation and damping ratios, offset, peak values of signals, especially things like inputs. But we have a problem. There are other possible attributes you might use, but these attributes are not particularly easy to use because there's not a simple link between these attributes and the state feedback gain K. So instead, a typical performance index we're going to use is called a quadratic measure of future behavior. And here you'll notice we're using the origin as the target for convenience. Um, but you don't have to, there are alternatives, but we won't cover those to save you the algebra. So this is what we're going to do. We can define our performance using this measure here, the integral between naught and infinity of x transpose qx plus u transposed ru. And you'll notice this has got weighted squares of the deviation of the states from the target, we're assuming the target is the origin, and it's got weighted squares of control activity. And we use squares because these lead to easier analysis and well-behaved solutions. If you look in the literature, you'll find some people have used one norms, um, infinity norms, but they tend to lead to much more difficult analysis and are far more sensitive. 
But here's a key point. You should note that this choice of performance index is an arbitrary choice. It's a choice that is made for convenience. Now, this performance index allows for relatively systematic design because you'll see the X transpose QX term implicitly measures convergence rate, rise time and settling. And the U transposed RU time implicitly penalizes aggressive use of the input, which are two of the key performance characteristics you would be interested in. So the choices of Q and R allow us to trade off between the importance of tracking and the importance of how aggressive the input is. So if you put all the emphasis through the Q, you'll get small tracking errors, but you might get lots of input activity. If you put all the emphasis on the R, then you'll keep the inputs to be very slow, but you might get larger tracking errors. So here's a summary. The attributes we might be interested in are things like rise time, and that's implicitly covered in the X transposed QX term. Settling time, that's also implicit in the X transposed QX term. Overshoot, oscillation and damping are also implicit in this same term. Because we've used squares, then positive errors and negative errors are penalized equally. So any oscillation is implicitly penalized. Offset is covered automatically because we have an infinite horizon. And beca because we have an infinite horizon, implicitly it's going to drive the asymptotic errors to zero. Otherwise, this J would not be bounded. Peak values of signals are also implicitly included because of the use of squares. And so therefore, with a square, larger values are penalized disproportionately compared to smaller values. So here's the key thing. This performance index J that we've chosen implicitly covers the sorts of attributes that we might be interested in and therefore is a good measure of performance. So the next question then is, how do we optimize this performance index with the respect to the parameters of a state feedback and subject to the given dynamics? So we want to minimize this, and you'll notice we're minimizing over the state feedback K, and we've also got to embed the fact that we've got state dynamics X dot equals AX plus BU. So how do we go about solving this particular optimization? Now, the answer is it's done via dynamic programming, and we're not going to cover that in this particular video because the derivation would be quite long and is slightly more advanced than we really want to cover. So what we're going to do is give you the solution. The key point is the solution is simple to find and simple to implement. So here it is. The solution is given by your state feedback K is R inverse B transposed P, where P is solved using this equation here. P is symmetric, and it's also required that R is invertible. You can see that because we've got an R inverse in here. And it's also logical <coughs> that R needs to be full rank, because if R was not full rank, then this term here would not be weighting all of the inputs. Some of the input directions would have no weighting, and therefore you may end up with very aggressive inputs in the optimal solution. So remarks. Assuming controllability, then optimal state feedback is guaranteed to be stabilizing. So that's a very useful property. Again, we're not going to prove it, um, except to say that the proof is relatively straightforward. The required computations, however, are not amenable to pen and paper in general, with the exception of a few trivial 2x2 two two cases. You really don't want to do this on pen and paper, so you should use a computer. And conveniently, MATLAB does this for you. If you stick in this command, k equals lqr, a, b, q, r, you will get the answer. Now, a final comment. It's quite common to use as your Q matrix something of this form, C transposed Q, C. And the reason we might do that is we might be more interested in a performance index which weights the outputs rather than the states. And you see, that's what I've done here. 
I've weighted the outputs y transposed q hat y, but this is equivalent to x transposed c transposed q hat c x. So you can see we can get output in the performance index simply by writing q as c transposed q hat c. What about discrete systems? Well, again, we'll just do this very, very briefly, except to say that it's analogous to the continuous time, with the only difference that you use a sum to infinity rather than an integral. And obviously, you've got a discrete model rather than a continuous model. And once again, you can get the solution from MATLAB using this command. And here you'll see it's DLQR, the D for discrete. And here's the solution. If you want to know what the algebra is, you'll find them relatively straightforward expressions. But you're not going to solve these on pen and paper for anything other than trivial examples. Some numerical examples then. Compare the closed loop behavior with different choices of R. You'll see I've got a second order system and a third order system. And for both of these, for convenience, I've just chosen Q to be I. But what I'm going to do <coughs> is I'm going to change the R and see what's the impact on the closed loop behavior. Implicitly, um, the state feedback changes as I change R. And how does the closed loop behavior change? Here's the first example then. So you'll notice I've got r equals 0 0.1, r is 0 0.1, r is 1, um, r is 10 in this one, and r is 100. So I've changed the r through a decade just to see what the impact is. Well, you can see that with r equals 0 0.01, the input, which is here in red, is reasonably smooth, it's not aggressive, and the states converge at a reasonable rate. If I choose r equals 0.1, the input is slightly different, but you'll notice that the states converge very slightly quicker. And that's what you would expect, because we've got, um, is that what we, sorry, I made a silly, silly mistake there. You'll notice the U is smaller. Okay, that's the key thing. The U is smaller because we've got a larger R. When we go to R equals 1, you'll see the U is smaller again. And now you'll notice the states are clearly getting slower. Once I go to R equals 10, you'll see that the U is very small. So I've penalized the input activity so much that the U is doing almost nothing. And the price I pay for that is that the state evolution is now largely uncontrolled and does what it wants. And going to r equals 100 is pretty much the same. So by the time that I've crucified the inputs this much, increasing r further doesn't really make much difference. So you'll notice that the key range where, making, where changing r has an impact is this range at the top, where I go from 0.01 to 1. And so I might say, well, OK, that's where my control freedom is. I can look at changing this R and seeing what's the impact on the state convergence and the input activity and what sort of balance do I want. And the key thing is, as R increases, the input activity gets less and less, but you get worse state behavior. So you have to decide what compromise you want. OK, so we've said that. Now, if R is too small, the focus is all on state convergence. And the danger of making R too small is that you have no regard to the input activity. So the input may be aggressive. And you'll see that here with a three state example. <laughs> now the input signal is in this light blue. And you'll see, so the input signal is up here when you have R equals 0 0.01. So it's relatively very aggressive. When I go to 0.1, the input signal is here. When I go to 1, the input signal is here. And then as R gets bigger and bigger, you see the input signal goes almost to 0. So if R is too small, the input is very aggressive. But what about the states? Well, we've noticed the issue about the input but the issue about the states is also slightly more complicated, because if you look here, you'll notice that these performances are actually quite similar. OK, so the state trajectories 
haven't changed much. You can see a slight change. If you look at this one here, if you look at this dark blue one, you'll see that's quicker than this dark, perhaps if I use black, it's quicker here than here and here. So you can see that as you increase R, that particular state is getting slower and slower. So you can see the trade-off, but you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, it's not enormously clear, and that's part of the challenge, that there is a trade-off, but the trade-off isn't always as clear-cut as you might like. So a summary. When a system is in controllable form, every coefficient of the closed-loop pole polynomial can be defined as desired using state feedback. Optimal state feedback gives you a more systematic approach to pole selection in that what it does is it focuses on the closed loop performance and selects the pole positions indirectly rather than directly. So in general, optimal state feedback will give better behavior than pole placement by enabling a more systematic tuning or trade-off between tracking and control activity. But you'll have noticed that this trade-off isn't as easy to use as you might like, but at least you do have some form of trade-off. However, you will also notice that if the system has got poor controllability, which was the case here when we looked at example two, it had relatively poor controllability, and therefore it's difficult to change some of the modes, and therefore changing Q&R won't necessarily have a big impact.